Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, since uh, we don't really need an introduction, uh, I'm just going to say welcome. And uh, you're here to do Father Keneally, who's put together a sort of a pictorial history of the buildings. All right, so with that, I will do Father Keneally. Thank you. And uh, welcome uh, to one and all. I'm glad that uh, you were free enough to join us today. I think this should be fun. We have a bunch of pictures here. And uh, now that the archives uh, has been digitizing our collection, we have quite a few pictures available. So I selected about 65 or 70 of them, see how far we can get. Uh, but this should be more in the nature of uh, something of interest to you about the history of the school. So don't hesitate to stop. If you have a question, why we can uh, we can discuss, especially those of us who have been around a while and want to maybe go down uh, memory lane a little bit. So we're going to start, and this is just a pictorial history uh, of Xavier, and we're going to begin uh, downtown. I'm sure many of you have little or no idea what the school looked like in its early years. So uh, why don't we start there? I want to thank Matthew here, my assistant. Uh, without him, this would not have occurred. And also Paul Weber in the back, who's uh, doing a video, thanks to you as well. So we'll start. This is a picture I'm sure all of you have seen more than once. But this is where it all started. And this is uh, downtown Cincinnati. It's the west side of Sycamore Street between 6th and 7th, about halfway through the block. If you've ever visited St. Xavier Church downtown, it stands where this church, this, this was the earlier version of it, and that's where St. Xavier would be today. This is the way it looked in 1831 when Xavier University first started. This was a school building here. It was called the Athenaeum. It was a school founded by Bishop Fenwick, the first uh, ordinary of Cincinnati. And uh, it was also referred to sometimes as the Literary Institute. It's not, well, you can't see it very well, but under Athenaeum was the motto, Religione Artibusque Sacrum, which means dedicated to religion and to the arts. This was the building itself. It was two and a half stories, and in the top door and the very top floor was the dormitory. Students lived up there, and many of them coming from the far south, as a matter of fact. To the left there is the cathedral. That was built in 1826. That was Bishop Fenwick's cathedral. Very nice. They were very happy of that. And in the center between was the bishop's residence. And also a few seminarians lived in there. That's how it looked in 1831. This property here did not belong to the school. The Jesuits, as you know, were invited in 1840 to come to the city to take over the school, which we did. So eight Jesuits, uh, three priests, uh, two seminarians, scholastics, and three brothers came from St. Louis, and they took over this building here. And they changed the name to St. Fran uh, Xavier College, St. Xavier College. Uh, interestingly enough, the cathedral remained cathedral five more years, and the bishop continued to live there for five more years until the new cathedral was finished at Athan Plum in 1845. Then Bishop Purcell, who was bishop at that time, moved out, and then this became St. Xavier Church over here, and the property became ours. I'd like to point out to you over here, this building here, referred to sometime as the engine house. In 1851, Father George Carroll became president of the school. He bought this property and tore it down. And he put up the Carroll building right here. I'm going to show it to you a little bit later on. But this is where it is. And then beyond that, in about 1868, a more permanent building went up, which was the Walter Hill. I'm going to show all those to you, but just to put them in context. Matthew? This is an interesting picture. This is from about 1870, but it's basically the same thing. Notice the very nice new church that went up in 1860, and they were very, very proud of it. At the time, it was the biggest church in the city, uh, even including the cathedral itself. But notice here, this is the old uh, Athenaeum building. It's still there. 
And by this time, it had become really very undesirable because the church overshadowed it. And they said it was almost impossible to do any work in here. The building was dark and gloomy. Even on the sunniest day, you needed not some kind of unnatural light. But notice here, and there are very few pictures of this, here is that George Carroll building I pointed out to you. One of the very few pictures we have of it. Father Carroll built this, and it was absolutely essential at the time because this building, the old Athenaeum building, was really uh, too small and too crowded. And then about 1868, the more permanent, this is the Walter Hill building, and 7th Street is just beyond it. And that is the beginning of the more permanent uh, building that I'll show you to you in just a minute. Matthew? This is a, a, a very tragic picture. As you may or may not know, the church downtown, St. Xavier Church, uh, was victimized by a very serious, disastrous fire. And this occurred on April the 7th. Today is the anniversary, 134 years ago today. It was Holy Thursday. Everyone had gone to bed. It, 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 was, it was rather late at night. They think the fire started at about 1130. But you can see the church just engulfed in flames. Um, the church was really gutted. I'll show you some pictures of it. And a terrible disaster. There's no, no question about it. They had just installed a magnificent new organ imported from Europe, utterly destroyed. The bell, which was one of the nicest in the city, somehow or other fell from the tower and crashed into Sycamore Street here. There's an interesting story behind it. The official story is that the fire was of unknown origins. That's what it said. And the college never said anything different, that it was of unknown. But there are at least two Jesuits who, in writing, have told us they thought it was arson, anti-Catholic cement. One of the reasons, and this picture may, may illustrate it, their contention is, and they're living in this building here, so they know what they're talking about. Their contention is the fire seems to have started in both the back and the front of the church. That the steeple was on fire at the same time as the other end of the building. And we will never know whether it was or not. Uh, but whatever is true, the uh, community as a whole, including many non-Catholics, contributed to the rebuilding of the church. It was considered that important in the city at the time. But notice, here is the Athenaeum building. They were terrified that this was going to come down. And I think there is a ladder here. They removed most of the furniture from that building to hoping to save it, and they did. Here's the Carroll building again, and you can see a little bit better here. This is the, the new Walter Hill building. And we think these are fire engines over here. Uh, fire engines, we have pictures of them from the period. They have a great big smokestack on them. And not only did smoke come out, but flames as well. And we think that's what it is. Matthew? Here's the result. This is the following day. And you can see the walls are standing, the foundation, but just about everything else was utterly destroyed. I think that this is Father Driscoll. Father Driscoll was pastor for about 35 years, much beloved. And he was absolutely devastated. He was despondent. They say you couldn't talk to him for four or five days afterwards. And uh, this was, of course, his baby, and he was very much tired. Matthew, the next. Here's the result, too, of the same day. You can see the damage that, that was done. Uh, one theory is that the fire may have started in the sanctuary, went up to the roof, and straight across the roof because of the way the roof was uh, built, and then got into the bell tower. But you can see, if you look closely, next to it is the Athenaeum building, and uh, the Carroll building is still there, and uh, the results of the fire. Matthew? Now, this, this picture um, is uh, not one of the more flattering. But this is what the school looked like downtown about the year 1910. And uh, let me just, this, of course, is the same area. The church would be over here, just out of the picture. This is the area in the school year, in the school where the Athenaeum was, 
where the Carroll Building was. Both of it. And this at the far end is the Walter Hill Building. This was at the corner of 7th and Sycamore. Very beautiful building with a, a, a double uh, entrance uh, stairways there. This first part was built in about 1868. Then a second section beyond it uh, in about 1885. And the section across the front uh, was about 1891. And that statue of Francis Xavier that you see over the entrance, that is now at Xavier High School. Uh, somewhere near the entrance to the high school, they, they preserve that. Not very good at preserving things around here, but we did save that. This then was the college. This was St. Xavier College down to 1919. In 1919, the college moved out of this building and it became exclusively the high school. This was the high school. Then the high school tore it down in 1960. Uh, I'll come back to that, but that's basically what it looked like downtown, except for one important thing. Most people don't know that our evening school remained downtown in 1919. The evening school of Xavier University was downtown in 1960 in this building. Do anybody remember this building at all? Some native Cincinnatians? Yes. This building has served three purposes over the years. But first of all, it's location. This is also on Sycamore Street, but a block south of the school. It's between 5th and 6th, and on the east side. The property was eventually sold to Procter & Gamble, and that's where their, um, their park area in front is. But this was built as a parochial grade school by the famous Father Finn, who was the writer of novels and a very, very great man whose biography should be written someday. It later became, well, the next picture might show it a little bit better. Yes, here it is. It says, of top, a, a parochial school, St. Xavier Commercial High School. See it there? It also served as a commercial high school for young ladies for a number of years. I think it was a two-year program. And then, see the sign there, Xavier University? Downtown College. That's where our downtown college was. Now, this has to be after, that signed anyway, not the building itself, obviously, has to be after 1930, because we didn't become a university until, until 1930. Uh, so uh, uh, that, um, but it, that's the building, and uh, I think kind of an interesting one. Matthew? I thought I would do is show you some aerial views of our campus in various times. Probably a best way to see what, how campus has changed. This has to date from about 1940. And let me just point out some things to you. This is the new campus. And you can see this would be Albers. This is Hinkle. This is Schmidt. And this is Edgecliff, just out of sight. Notice there's no Logan. No Logan building. And notice no library, no shot, and no altar hall on this side. Uh, over here, notice the football stadium, where the soccer field now is, over here. And notice just above it, that building, um, the, the uh, up top there, that was the, um, they called it the Union Building. It was originally the Avondale Athletic Club. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Next to it, you can see Ellert Hall which was the first dormitory built. And it was built there because the Union Building is where the cafeteria, the library, and everything else was. So it seemed logical to put the dormitory over there. Football stadium, and you can see the uh, Schmidt Field House as well. Kind of interesting. Next picture, uh, Matthew. Now, this has to be about 1963. Um, Notice a number of things here. Here is that Union building I mentioned to you, the, the only building on campus when we came. There it is. It's still there. That did not come down till 68. And it's where Joseph is presently. This is uh, Dana Avenue here, where Dana goes up to Reading Road. Notice Sycamore House there. Notice the field house, the armory, which went up in 48. And notice that football stadium how conspicuous it was right in the middle. That seated 15,000 people. That was probably one of the largest football fields around. Notice Brockman. 
But notice there's no university center in there at all. You can see the chapel, which went up in, 80, in 62, an altar hall in 61, but no library. No library. And on this side, notice, we're going to come back to this, this building right here, North Hall. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Isn't that an interesting picture, though, for those who have been around a while? And next picture, uh, Matthew. Now, here's another one. This is about 18, uh, 19, 1965, uh, as best I can place it. Uh, of course, you see the chapel, which was relatively new. And this is the old university center building, torn down about 2000 to make way for Gallagher. Here was the theater, this end here. And um, there was the famous Vonderhaar Terrace Room on the side there. You can see it there. Uh, over here, of course, is there is Ledgewood as a street. Here's where Clint A came into it there. Notice North Hall. See that barracks building there? Now long gone. That's right in here. And of course, you know, there's a Linder there as well. Interesting picture. Matthew? Now this must be about, when did I figure? This is about 65 for a couple of reasons. Um, of course, you see Altar Hall here and the famous arches. Many of them around, around, and uh, they've come down. Um, the University Center building is there. Hussman is there, but notice Kuhlman is not. This is prior to Kuhlman. And the house there, Boylan Hall, between Altar and Temple, that was where the admissions office was for a number of years. But you can see Ledgewood Avenue there before it was closed and where Clint A comes into it. Okay, next to picture. Um, now, this, this may be about 66, but, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's later than that. This has to be about 71. Notice the Union Building is gone, and we now have uh, Joseph. Here is Ellet Hall, and you can see Ellet Hall was never really finished. From time to time, they were going to put on the other wing, as they said, never got around to it. Uh, you can see um, St. Barbara Hall. On the other side, you can see the Schott Building. That was dedicated and opened in 1970. The library is now there, 67. Altar Hall, 62. The Chapel, 62. And notice that Kuhlman is now, Kuhlman is now in there. Kuhlman is in there. Notice up top the old U.S. shoe factory was there. That was all given to the university about 1980, and that is now where um, the Cohen Center is, and also the parking lot for Centos. Notice the old rainbow factory? So, yeah, there. And the one I really want to point out at the very top, you can only see part of it, is the old Zumbio box plant. And we're going to come back to that later on. See up at the very top? It's only a little bit of it, because that was a huge building. That all had to come down in order to make room for the university station. Notice uh, that South Hall is still here, North Hall is still here. Okay. Next picture. Now, you may say, what in the world is this? Well, it's a design probably dating from about 1915. But I'm putting it here to give you some idea of what our property originally looked like. In 1911, Father Hireman, the president, purchased this land. It was the Avondale Athletic Club at the time. And this is the property he got. It's 26 and a half acres, and only one building on it was the Avondale Athletic Club clubhouse. And it was right here. We've seen it before. Here's Dana Avenue. Now, what did we get? What was the property? Well, the east boundary, if you look up top, was Harold Avenue. Now, that's the, Herald, the section of Harold that was closed for the mall. That's now the academic mall. That was the east boundary. The south boundary is Dana Avenue, coming all the way around. The uh, west boundary is Winding Way, along here, down to about where the uh, uh, armory now is. The north boundary, a little bit harder to uh, define, I think was actually where the baseball diamond the north end of the baseball diamond, then it goes up. 
maybe the stairs between Gallagher and um, uh, Lindner today, up to the mall. What is in here, of course, this is the one building that existed. It was mostly playing fields, baseball diamonds, football fields, tennis courts. And there may have been an auditorium or a swimming pool, too. That seems to be that black area. The other are proposed buildings. That's what this drawing really was supposed to serve. Matthew? And there is the uh, Union Building. This is the Avondale Country Club building. It was a very lovely building. And of course, out over here would be uh, where the um, Henkel and buildings like that stood. Uh, let me show them the next one as well. This is another angle, but obviously later. It has to be later because this is, they could, the students call it the Red House, or the Red Building. And you can see Hink, uh, Ellet behind it there. So that must be about 25, 26, and then this would be Victory Parkway, or what would become Victory Parkway. So you're looking up at, at it uh, in, a, I guess, more northerly direction. Is that clear? Can you figure out where it is? Yeah. Matthew? This is inside the building. Now, the athletic club was apparently a rather swanky place in its day. It didn't last very long, but we, we were very proud of this colonial building. And this is a party staged by the university, probably from the 50s. That would be my guess. Matthew? I love the hats on the ladies here. This is probably a card club, maybe for the mothers, maybe again from the 50s. And uh, they, I, I think this was probably on the very first floor of the Avondale Athletic Club. Matthew? In the basement, there was a bowling alley. The only time Xavier had bowling alleys, and this was in the basement of that building. Uh, rather primitive looking, but I guess it served the purpose. Matthew? Here's another picture of the same thing. Downstairs, the, the bowling alley. And then here are students. I think this was probably on the, the, the upper floor, the students. And, and this was, I'm sure, regarded as a luxury in its day compared to what they had from downtown. And here are the students. This is the student cafeteria. And this remained the cafeteria until 1965 when the student union opened. Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, I'm sure that's not beer they're drinking there, anybody? <laughs> Next picture. Then. And um, I should mention, I, I think this, going back to what you just saw, that the university came out here, the college at the time, in 1919. For that first year, the only building they had was that red building, the union building I just pointed, the only building they had. The Jesuits who taught here lived downtown and commuted on the streetcar. And they had the choice, either the uh, Montgomery Road streetcar or the Reading Road. Can you imagine getting on a streetcar at 7th and Sycamore, coming out, walking from Reading Road? <laughs> Leave it to your imagination. And all labs were downtown. Students had to go down there. But this building, as you can see, in the 20s. And this is uh, what we now call Edgecliff Hall. At the time, it was Alumni Hall. And beyond it, you can see under construction, um, Hinkle. This building opened in time for the 1920 school year. And Hinkle became the Jesuit residence, and it opened on Thanksgiving Day, 1920, when the first meal was served there. Matthew? I want to point this out to you, because this is a bit of Xavier history you should know. This is a fountain, very lovely fountain. This is Rookwood, by the way. This was a fountain originally. It is no longer, but the, but the shrine still exists. And this is in Edgecliff Hall. You want to stop and look at it sometime. If you're in Schmidt Building, you're near Dr. Chadwick's office, and you go down the corridor into uh, Edgecliff, and you're going down to the long recital room, this is on the left-hand side. And it's really quite lovely. Um, this was built by the American Legion, and it m commemorates uh, George W. Buddy, who was a Xavier student. I don't believe an alum, but a student. And he is thought to be the last American to die in the First World War. 
I'm not terribly sure of that, but he, we know he died on November the 11th Armistice Day. So he was one of the very last casualties. Matthew? And here is a ceremony uh, dedicating this particular uh, fountain at that time. Memorial Fountain, dedicated in honor of George W. Buddy, class of 17, who was killed in action. Uh, and this is the famous Father Hubert Brockman. He was president at the time, a very, must have been a wonderful man. And that, I think, is George Buddy's dad as well in the picture there. And that is still there. It's, it's a very nice shrine. When next time you're in that building, take a look at it. Matthew? The old timers will remember this. Um, this is Marion Hall. And uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting building. This uh, building is located in North Avondale. It um, would be to the west of the armory. If you leave the armory going west and you cross Winding Way and you go up Marion Avenue to Dakota, you'll encounter this building. Now, the university bought this in 1943, during the Second World War. And the idea was to turn it into a dormitory, which we did. And it seemed ideal at the time. It accommodated, we thought, about 60 students. It was very near Ellet Hall, only about a block away, and only by a block away from the Red Building. So that we have a cluster there of cafeteria and dormitories. And um, in 58, Father John Felton, whom a number of us remember, prevailed upon the university to make this the HAB Honors Dormitory, which it was for a number of years. So honors students lived in here. This is where you would have lived, David, had you come. Next uh, picture. Here are the HAB students arriving for classes uh, in the fall of the year and, and the entranceway to the building there. Next. This is, a very, this is the way the building looked as Mr. Anger built it. It was built in 1898. And we uh, turned this, in, I believe, into the chapel. I think this served as the chapel. And isn't that lovely? Uh, I think that's still there. Uh, the building is still there, certainly. I hope it's as nice as this picture makes it look. And this was the carriage house behind. The carriage house we also used for a while as a dormitory, but we also had an art gallery in there at one time. This would be immediately behind uh, Marion Hall up in Marion and Dakota. Okay. Now, this is interesting. You may not know that Bellarmine Chapel was originally located in the Schmidt Building. Probably most people do not know this. Uh, the Schmidt building was put up. That's where the president is and Dr. Chad with that building, where the um, uh, Connaughton boardroom is. Well, this room is right below the Connaughton boardroom, where the comptroller is today. And in 27, that was made the chapel of the university. At the same time, it became a parish church for the archdiocese. And this is 1949. And I'll tell you why I know this. This is it. This, this is the Comptroller's office here in Smith Hall. On this occasion, a very solid one, at the end of the line is Father James McGuire. He was president of Xavier at the time. Father Marshall Lockbeeler, who was president of Xavier High School. And Father Garrity, who was pastor of St. Xavier Church. And why were all the heavies here? Well, Father McGuire is carrying uh, a reliquary. You can't see it here. I'll show you another picture. This is the occasion on which a relic of St. Francis Xavier came to campus. It is his arm. His arm was brought from Goa to the United States. It toured the United States in 1949. I happened to see it at the time. It was brought to Xavier University, and that's the occasion. Next picture. This is the crowd arriving. And of course, you're in smell. You see, the door is still there. That, that's, that's the comptroller's office now. And everybody there lining up to see the arm of St. Francis Xavier. I don't know, it's, it's interesting to see the costume of people. Next picture. And there it is. That, that's the reliquary. That is the arm of St. Francis Xavier. That's Father McGuire, our president. Went on to become president of Loyola in Chicago. A very, very fine man. I think this might be Father Wyatt Track serving as master summonies, but I'm not sure about that. And that's the same chapel. Matthew? 
this is a, a student mass in the same chapel. And here they really, and it was a constant conflict. The students and the parishioners. Uh, the, the parishioners were complaining the students were coming to their masses and the students said, well, this is our chapel and uh, it, it was a mess for years. Next picture. You know, I don't, that's a, go back one, never mind. Uh, they, they might have been, because wow. uh, they might have been, and I don't know where those are. Would anybody, no one here probably would not know. No. The Stations of the Cross, the, the pictures along the wall there. Yeah, Matthew? This is interesting, a wedding. It was a parish, so they had weddings here regularly. Uh, a rather somber affair, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yes. That's right, that's right, no, no. Yeah. Matthew, can we go to the next one? And this, I guess, this is actually a group of Sedali. That's Father John Mahoney standing there. And um, I don't know if you were here from my lecture on the spy Harry Gold, the lecture I gave in November. Harry Gold was a Xavier graduate. He was also a spy for the Soviet Union. He was caught and went to prison for 16 years. In his testimony, he pressed him on before Congress, he spoke about his years at Xavier as the best years of his life. And one of the great embarrassments of his life is that everything he did reflected so unfavorably on Xavier University, on the Jesuit fathers there, and my many good friends. His greatest friend of all was Father Mahoney, and he referred to him in particular. And when he was being investigated by the FBI and about to be caught, he thought seriously of contacting Father Mahoney because he said he thought he's the only human being who would have understood my situation. And uh, Harry Gold was deeply repentant for what he did, uh, but um, at that point, too late. He was a spy. We'll move on. Now this, uh, I think you'll enjoy this next group of pictures. I showed you a more luxurious living over in uh, Marion Hall. But this has an interesting history. In 46, Xavier University suddenly had far more students it knew what to do with. In 45, 46, the last, or I'm sorry, yeah, 45, 46, just as the war was ending, we had about 100 university students. The following year, we had 1,400. And the problem is, all, all veterans, practically all veterans, and all coming on the GI Bill. Where were we going to put them? So the university bought from the army about 10 of those barracks buildings. <laughs> and you can see where they were. There where the library now is, where Alter Hall now is. You see, um, you can see Hinkle there in the background, and you, and you can see Schmidt. And then interesting, next picture. Lovely accommodations. The, there were 10 of these, and they apparently stretched all the way from where shot now would be, all the way over to the chapel, that, that whole length through there. Uh, they, there were three to a room. There were eight rooms, so there were 24 men living in each one of these. It was heated by an oil-burning stove. But they say the walls were so thin, it was a waste of time. They, they didn't heat anything at all. Next. There they are. Isn't that a wonderful picture? <laughs> No, no. Look, I like the ones smoking the cigar, and I think they're listening to the radio. But I guess this is the oil burning stove. I guess that's what it is there. Yeah. It wasn't oil burning. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Next picture. Here's one of the students moving in to his luxury accommodations there. Look at the wood floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matthew? There it is. That's another picture of the same thing. The next one. Here's a student arrived. Look, look at those lovely beds. Life was primitive in those days. I think Mike Connaughton, those of you who know Mike Connaughton, think he actually lived in this one of these buildings. Yeah, the former board chair. Now, Roger Fortin says in his book that those <laughs> barracks lasted seven years. That can't be. Look at that picture. Alter Hall, no, they're, they're, see, they're over there. They're still there, at least some of them, a couple on the left. The library is under construction. That has to be 66, 67. And there's Alter Hall, finished. This went into the 60s, clearly, a lot more than seven years. 
But they had a problem in 1946. These barracks did not arrive on time. They only came until about early part of November. So the problem was, where were they going to put all these students in the meantime? Think about that. Well, they decided to open up the field house as a dormitory for about 240 men. Show them the picture. There it is. Oh That's the floor of the field house. Oh my God. <laughs> and these are all veterans. So I, I yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. But isn't that interesting? And they, I think Father Bushman, those of us who remember Father Bushman, he was the, door, the prefect of these people. And he said they were very well behaved, very well behaved. And, uh, but isn't that, and look at the desks, the beds. Next picture. And uh, this is South Paul um, that I referred to a couple. You can see where it is. This is Dana Avenue. And you probably recognize the arches. That was a key building. Uh, this also was purchased from the United States Army uh, in 1946. And let me show you what was in there. It was the snack lounge, not the cafeteria. That was still over in the red building. But this became a very popular snack room in the building I just showed you. And you probably have seen that picture. It was hanging over in uh, Sent House for a while. It's the very same area. Dana. Also in there, I think this was the section that, that paralleled Dana. This was the theater from about 45 to 65. And they put on uh, ambitious productions here, um, Hamlet and Macbeth and Lunas with And I think they just turned the chairs around and that was the stage. <laughs> Next one, Matthew. Now this is the new Bellarmine Chapel. This is uh, interesting. This would be about 1961-62. The chapel was dedicated in December 62. This is Bellarmine Chapel as we now know it under construction. And, uh, and let me give you some interesting statistics on this. The chapel is 122 feet. The roof has a 122 uh, foot span. It is in the form of what they call a hyperbolic Paral, 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 paraboloid. Yeah, thank you very much. And it is the, the roof obviously not support, supported by the walls at all, but by the two abutments. And underneath the abutments, and I guess the ground there, there is a system of underground steel cables under a tension of 465,000 pounds that provides force necessary to support the two abutments and the roof. Kind of interesting, isn't it, design? And you can look right through it. That's uh, Logan Hall there. Next one. This is the same thing, you're looking at the abutments here, but also very interesting. There is no Gallagher Center. There is no University Center. That is Brockman Hall. And there was a basketball court, some of you remember, on this side of it. You just look right through to Brockman there. Next one. This is the same thing, just from a somewhat different angle, but you can see Logan Hall there. This is the dedication in December 1962. And um, some of you will remember, this is Archbishop Alter who came. It was a chapel, so he consecrated the chapel. This is Father Oren T. Wheeler, the former registrar of the camp, and also Father Brueggemann. Don't you like those Berettas? The, the, the they have gone on a style. Maybe we should bring those back to her. <laughs> but that's a neat picture. Next one. And they're about to see uh, altar hall behind it there. They're about to enter the chapel there, having blessed the outside of the building. This is interesting from several points of view. This is the dedication or consecration of the chapel on the inside. And that is Archbishop uh, Altar. See his crozier there. And uh, he is in the process of blessing it. But it's also interesting because you, it gives a younger generation an idea of what the church looked like prior to Vatican II. Notice the altar against the back wall of the church. Notice the tabernacle in the center, the old style, and of course the sanctuary. And then uh, notice the altar railing. That was also obligatory. And there it is. Next picture. 
This is a little bit later. I think this is about 65. It's the same chapel, of course. And this is Father Robert Manning. I believe it is the celebration of his golden jubilee. He was 50 years a Jesuit. He was pastor of Bellarmine at the time. That's a solemn high mass. And notice, again, the altar against the, the wall to the back of there. And the gospel is being read. Remember, we're at a solemn high mass. And there is Father Bushman. He's incensing the book there on the farm. And notice the choir behind there. That all has been changed around. And notice the communion rail here across the front. And that's Father Manning. We're indebted to Father Manning. Father Manning did a great deal of work in the archives and saved many valuable documents for us. We needed more Father Mannings in the archives. I'm going to talk now uh, about the, uh, the mall, the academic mall, I'll give you something of its history. Uh, do you know where you are here? This is Dana here. And this must be about 1957, I would guess, because the city of Cincinnati uh, closed this section of Herald for us in May 1958. And you can see uh, Edgecliff there. You can see um, the Schmidt building. And this would be the entrance and how it, it, it winds a little bit to the left there. Matthew? Here's the same thing from the other end. Now, I think Bellarmine Chapel would be right here. It really was, is right in what was the roadway. And here comes the road down, and this was around. Here's Logan. There is Elbers. And, down on, and then over here, of course, no library and no altar. This would be about maybe 1958, 59. Interesting, isn't it? The next one. This is the mall at a later date, probably sometime, maybe even in the 70s. Uh, but it gives you a good picture of the arches that were controversial. And, you know, if you remember that. And uh, notice the library is here with that fountain. Remember the fountain? Every spring, some student would put soap in there. And you come in there, and you had soap water just coming out of that fountain. And, uh, then also the Musketeer Plaza, I'll show it to you in a minute, but it would be off to the left here. Okay. This is Musketeer Plaza, and this was designed in 1958. Uh, Altar Hall is right here, over here. And it was really quite, this was the work, I think, of Ed von der Haar. The idea was this. We, the university really didn't have any kind of statue of D'Artagnan. And so in 62, the class of 62, contributed money just for that. Well, it took six years, but this was the result. This was actually a statue done in Auch in France for us, thanks to Dr. Bourgeois and his wife. And it was created over here, put on that particular uh, stadium. And this was uh, the, what they simply referred to as the Plaza. It was dedicated at homecoming in 1968, and I think it was a, a rather nice touch. You know. Yeah. Uh, the statue is still here. It's in storage. The problem is it, the weather was very unkind to it. It really was beginning to wear throughout. And we knew we couldn't leave it outside anymore. We still have it. And the question is, where should it go? I think it also would have to be touched up considerably. But it's still with us. Still with us, yeah. There was some thought of putting it in the Sintas at one time. But I think they ruled that out. <clears throat> Here's another view of the same thing, the library and shot behind it, a uh, rather interesting view. This is 1996, the souls who were here at that time. The old mall gave way to the new mall. And this was the nightmare we lived with. This for about six months, wasn't it, Paul? A good six months. It, it, the mall's obviously being torn up. And you couldn't get from the chapel to shot except by going through buildings on one side or the other. It, it took ingenuity to get from one side of the campus <laughs> to the other. That's what it looked like at the time. And here is the same. This is the, these are the arches coming down. This is 1996. Uh, the arches came down, and uh, that was part of the renovation of the mall. Okay. This uh, is a building the old timers will remember. Uh, a very nice looking building. This is the University Center building. And it stood 
where Gallagher now stands. This building was torn down in 2000 to make way for Gallagher. It was a lovely building in many ways, and it was very just exactly where uh, Gallagher is today. And as I mentioned, this was the theater, the theater loft here. There were, I think, including the basement, three levels to the building. Uh, there was a very fine cafeteria in there, Musketeer Inn, the bookstore was here, and then on the left there was the Von der Hart Terrace area. I put this in. This is the, actually the boardroom from the old university center. But it's an interesting picture. This is the Board of Trustees and one of the very first times that laymen served on the board and there's some rather distinguished lay people there. It was Father Mulligan, this is Father Mulligan in the middle, our president, who introduced laymen to the board. And um, the board chair at the time was Mr. Fletcher Nice here. Uh, and he was the first lay chairman of the board. Very, very fine man. Next to him is Ralph Corbett, the famous Ralph Corbett, who contributed so significantly to the arts here in Cincinnati. Bill Williams, uh, of the, of the um, Big Red Machine fame, one of the owners of the Reds at the time, Henry Hobson, and of course at the far end, you recognize him, Paul? Yeah. On the far left, Mike Connaughton. Mike Connaughton. Yeah, Mike Connaughton, yes. And Bob and Bill Cole helped me out. But at any rate, that's an interesting picture, and that was in the boardroom of the old University Center. This is the shot building uh, when it was first built. This was built as a Jesuit residence. And that's what it looked like at the time. The original um, Jesuit residence, of course, was Hinkle Hall, which, as I said, opened in 1920. And we moved into this building in February of 1970. And it was the residence until 1990. This is what our chapel looked like uh, forever and ever. I, I always liked this chapel. The acoustics were terrible, just terrible. And the benches and pews were rather spartan. But it's, it's a lovely chapel, and this is now used, I think, by admissions as some kind of a, maybe reception hall. Yeah, multi-purse. Yeah, okay. Well, the stained glass windows are still there. Yes, that's right. They're still there. That's right. Yeah. Yes. This was the dining room. Where was the dining room? This was the dining room. And now was the reception area. They turned the building around. This is now the main entrance to the building. This comes in. All these windows were taken out. And this is where the reception desk now is in the admissions office on the uh, second floor there. That was a very nice dining room, very nice. And this was the 10th floor. This was the reading and recreation area. Notice the ashtrays, long gone now. And this is up on Matthew. And I thought I would close uh, with this very interesting picture of the Thetabera Villa. This was an honors house and a house with much history. Theta Berra was an actress in the silent era. She was born in Cincinnati, actually born in Avondale. She was not born in this house. She built this on the Mediterranean style. And she lived here for about four or five years, although she had relatives in the East and spent a great deal of time in Hollywood. She made about 40 movies, most of which I understand have been destroyed in a fire, uh, unfortunately. But uh, this became the Honors House, Paul, for a number of years. And the university very reluctantly tore this down 70 years ago, maybe. Uh, it just became too expensive to maintain. We have a little piece of it stuck over. Oh, do you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good, good. And I don't want to keep me along, but I want to show you, as the pièce de résistance, uh, a, a video. This is the implosion of the zombie old box factory. And uh, Darrell and I are arguing about when this occurred. We won't, you can figure it out as you want, but we won't show it to you. I think you'll find this really interesting. This will be our final piece. It's the end of an era, but it's the beginning of a new one. Oh, it was incredible. You could feel the shock waves, you know, the loud, loud explosion, the, the 
the building coming down is amazing. Once in a lifetime opportunity. It's still exciting for the school and the, uh, the plans that they have for the vision of 2010. My first um, reaction was uh, pretty emotional. I was standing there with Bob Zumbiel. I think both of us kind of got a tear in our eyes. Bob said, uh, you know, John, this is the end of an era. And I said, well, Bob, uh, it is for Zumbiel, but you're, you're allowing us to create a new community, a new neighborhood. And so we are, you know, pledging ourselves to make something good here. It was kind of sad because there was a lot of us in there. And uh, we've been there since 62. And it went up in smoke. But uh, it's good for Xavier. And it's, it was good for us because we've got a new location working out well. It changes the whole uh, area. You know, the, the main thing is that the interest in this area stems from the uni Xavier University being here. And, and that's, that's what brings it. So when we got, and I've talked to John Kusher for years, and we've got this partnership that working together with the city and Xavier University, and then it's working perfectly. The first uh, call it statement that this is making on the part of Xavier is the realization that the health and vitality of the university and the surrounding community are interdependent and so to that extent uh, you know we know it's time for Xavier to be more than an anchor in the community but to be a catalyst and, and so to that end that's really the first motivation uh, you know, that we have. And that's it. Well, thank you very much. You've been a very good audience. <laughs> and there are plenty more pictures where those came from, so we'll be back. If Daryl will put up with us. <laughs>